Rwandan National Neonatal Protocol Resuscitation by Dr. Christian Umaoza. Introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Umaoza Christian. I'm a general pediatrician working at University Teaching Hospital of Kigali, known as Sashika, and I'm a member of Rwanda Pediatric Association. Today, we're going to talk about neonatal resuscitation. Overview. By the end of this chapter, participants will be able to prepare for delivery, identify prenatal conditions that increase the risk of needing resuscitation at delivery, identify the equipment and personnel needed at each delivery in preparation for neonatal resuscitation, and also they will be able to explain the full increasing levels of neonatal resuscitation and how to assess the need to move to a higher level of intervention. They will also be able to demonstrate effective bag mask penetration in the newborn. Considerations in neonatal resuscitation. The first question is, why is newborn resuscitation important? Resuscitation can prevent bad asphyxia, which is the leading cause of neonatal death in Rwanda. If not done quickly and correctly, babies can suffer long-term consequences, including brain damage or death. If resuscitation is ineffective or delayed, the clinical status will worsen over time, making resuscitation increasingly difficult. Newborn resuscitation is one of the most effective interventions in medicine. The necessary equipment is very simple, and most babies respond very well if the procedure is done promptly and correctly. Which newborns need resuscitation? Most babies are born vigorous, meaning that providing warmth, Clearing the airways, drying, and providing stimulation is enough to keep them healthy. But about 10% of those newborns will require some assistance to begin regular breathing, such as positive pressure ventilation. Only 1% of newborns require extensive resuscitation, including chest compression and medication. This means that it can be easy for clinicians to lose their skills in resuscitation as there are few opportunities for practice. Clinicians should be sure to find some way to practice frequently, including using mock codes. What do you need for an effective resuscitation? It is important to implement a resuscitation system within every hospital. Key elements include skilled staff, equipment, staff assignment, and strong teamwork and communication. Staff should be assigned to the mother and newborn to prepare materials before delivery and to clean and prepare materials every shift to ensure all equipment is available and accessible for every delivery. Resuscitation can often be needed when not expected, so it is necessary to prepare for resuscitation at every delivery. Identify a helper and review the emergency plan, which should be a part of every birth plan. Every birth should be attended by at least one person whose only responsibility is to the baby and who is capable of initiating resuscitation. It is not sufficient to have someone on call for neonatal resuscitation. Prepare the bathing area for delivery, making sure that it is clean, warm, and well lit. Eliminate draft from fans, open windows, and doors. Wash your hands to prevent infection and make sure that everyone who attends the delivery has washed their own hands. Prepare area for resuscitation and check to ensure that all equipment is clean, within reach, and functioning properly. Can you name what you need to have gathered ahead of time to perform an effective resuscitation? The following equipment is essential at the delivery. You need gloves, clean, warm towers and clothes, a ventilation bag and mask of the proper size, a suction device, scissors and tie for the umbilical cord, a clock or timer with second hand, a newborn sized hat, and a stethoscope. Additionally, oxygen, a nasogastric tube, IV infusion equipment and medication and fluids such as adrenaline dextrose 10% and normal saline should be present if available. The following are risk factors which increase the risk for nerve cessation. 
prematurity, meconium stained amniotic fluid, perinatal distress, maternal or fetal blood loss, difficult or prolonged delivery and the risk of infection, which include maternal fever, chorioaminoitis, and prolonged rupture of membranes. These factors are causes or symptoms of intrauterine distress, which makes a newborn more likely to have immediate need for assistance at birth. The order of priority for assistance can easily be remembered by the acronym A, B, C, and D, which stands for airways, breathing, circulation, and drugs. Drugs should only be used if trained staff and equipment are available. This algorithm should be posted prominently at all delivery sites. I will walk you through the individual step of this algorithm over the course of this chapter. Answer these questions. Is the newborn full-term gestation? Is the newborn breathing or crying? Does the newborn have good muscle tone? If the answers to all of the previous questions are yes, the newborn is vigorous and can receive routine care. Dry her with a clean cloth and keep her warm by skin-to-skin -skin contact and a blanket and heart if available. Clap and cut the umbilical cord. If the answer to any of the previous questions is no, the newborn is not vigorous and requires further care. Begin level 1 of neonatal assistation and call for additional assistance if needed. There are four increasing levels of intervention for neonatal resuscitation. Level 1 is to warm, dry, stimulate, and suction. Level 2 involves positive pressure ventilation. Level 3, chest compression, and level 4, IV intubation and adrenaline. The newborn should be assessed every 30 to 60 seconds to decide whether it is necessary to move to the next level. These levels are shown on the algorithm. Level 1 involves warming the newborn, drying him immediately with a clean cloth, stimulating him by rubbing his back two to three times, and suction of the airway if it is obstructed or the baby is not crying. Prevention of heat loss is critical during a resuscitation. A newborn should be pressed on the mother's chest if there are no anticipated risk factors for needing resuscitation. If there are concerns, the newborn should be placed on a preheated overhead radiant warmer. Blankets and towels should not be warmed by placing them on top of the warmer due to risk of fire. If using or make depot, the newborn should be positioned so that the head is closest to the person and is possible for assistation to allow easy access to the airway. Dry the newborn quickly with a warm towel to remove amniotic fluid and prevent evaporative heat loss. This act of drying also provides gentle stimulation which may initiate or help maintaining breathing. The newborn should also be stimulated by gently rubbing his back and soles of his feet. Never hold the newborn upside down. Slap him on the back or rub him with alcohol. The next step in level 1 resuscitation involved clearing the airway with suction. The infant should be positioned with his neck slightly extended and his mouth should be suctioned before his nose. We now move on to level 2 resuscitation. First, assess the newborn's breathing and look for chest movement or crying. Grunting or weak breath are not adequate. If the newborn is breathing well, keep him warm and observe closely to ensure that he continues to breathe well. If he is not breathing well, call for help and transfer him to the newborn resuscitation area. Position the newborn's head so that his neck is slightly extended and start positive pressure ventilation with a mask and safe operating bag within the first minute after birth. Positive pressure ventilation should be provided for infants with apnea or gasping breath and heart rate of less than 100 beats per minute. Ventilating the ranks is the single most important and effective step 
in non-autolysis station. Restoration of adequate ventilation will usually result in, in, in a rapid improvement in heart rate. This method is also known as bag mask ventilation. To perform positive pressure ventilation, stand at the head of the infant and use the C grip with your thumb and first finger toward the mask on the infant's face. Use your remaining three fingers to pull his jaw up to the mask. To ensure effective ventilation, check for good chest rise with each breath. If the newborn's chest is not rising, clear the airway, repositioning his head to open the airway, assure that there is a good seal of the mask and that there is adequate pressure, and check your equipment. Correct size and positioning of the mask is essential to effective ventilation. To assess a newborn's heart rate, Listen to his heart with a stethoscope after one minute of ventilation. In case you don't have a stethoscope, you can feel the umbilical pulse, but the recommended method is to use a stethoscope. If his heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, this is serious and you should add chest compression as will be covered in the next section. An easy way to measure the heart rate is to count beats for 6 seconds and then multiply this number by 10. You should also assess the infant's color when deciding whether or not to give oxygen. If central cyanosis persists for more than two minutes, oxygen is needed. If the newborn has only acrocyanosis, oxygen is not needed. If the infant's heart rate falls below 60 beats per minute, move to the next level of intervention, chest compressions, which are outlined in this section of the algorithm. It is important that you perform chest compression in the correct location on the chest. Apply pressure to the lower third of the sternum, just below the nipple line, but take care to avoid applying pressure to the xiphoid. There are two possible methods to use for chest compressions. The hands around chest method is preferred because it is less tiring, allows for better control of depth, and supports the newborn's back. Two fingers compression can also be done, but by comparison, they are more tiring and difficult to control. For chest compression to be effective, they have to be performed at the correct depth and rate of compression, and the infant must be on a firm surface. To achieve the right depth, Compress to about a third of chest depth and leave your fingers in contact with the newborn chest during the relaxation phase. Perform compressions at a rate of 90 per minute with three compression and one breath every two seconds. Coordinate your rate of chest compression with bag mask ventilation, which is 30 breaths per minute. Give three chest compressions, then stop for one breath with that cycle of three compressions and one breath taking two seconds. Call for assistance and the reassess airway, breathing, and circulation, or ABC, every one to two minutes to determine next steps. Risks associated with chest compressions include lip fracture, puncturing the lungs, and the liver laceration caused by xiphoid pressure. After assessing heart rate, breathing, and color, clinicians must decide how to proceed. If the newborn's heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, continue ventilation and chest compression. If there is adequate staffing and skills, consider moving to the next step of IV and adrenaline. If the newborn's heart rate is over 100 beats per minute and the baby is breathing well, reassess and provide post resuscitation care. An infant receiving prolonged ventilation should have an orgasmic tube pressed in order to decompress his stomach. Again, ABC should be reassessed every one to two minutes for as long as the newborn is being resuscitated with artificial ventilation.
If the newborn's heart rate is over 60 beats per minute and the baby is not breathing well, continue ventilation and stop the chest compressions. Adrenaline increases heart rate as well as the strength of cardiac contractions. Administration by IV is preferred, though it is also possible to administer by endotracheal tube. Regardless of the route, administer the drug and flush quickly with normal saline. The recommended concentration for newborn is 1 over 10,000 or 0.1 mg per milliliter. An appropriate dose in mg is 0.01 to 0.03 mg per kg, which equals to 0.1 to 0.3 mL per kg by IV. If the newborn's heart rate is still below 60, continue chest compression and repeat the dose every 3 minutes. Adrenaline 1 over 1000 must be diluted to 1 over 10,000 before administration. To do this, mix 0.1 ml adrenaline with 0.9 ml of sterile water or saline, then administer. The dilution process should always be checked by a second person, as it is especially prone to error in stressful situations. To practice, let's determine the correct dosing of adrenaline for a newborn weighing 2 kg. For that newborn, 2 kg multiply by 0.01 mg per kg is 0.02 mg. How many milliliters of adrenaline 1 over 1000 solution is this? It is 0.02 milliliters, which is too small to give. We have to dilute. And if we dilute this to 1 over 10,000 solution, it is 0.2 milliliters. Resuscitation efforts may be discontinued after 10 minutes of effective neonatal resuscitation if there is still no breathing and no pulse. It is best to have a second person present to assure the two providers agree when stopping resuscitation. For preterm infants, there are several factors that increase risk of resuscitation. Preterm infants can lose heat easily and have difficult breathing due to weak muscles and immature lungs. Resuscitation itself is increasing the risk, especially in those premature babies, because of their immature immune systems, fragile capillaries in the brain, and small blood volume. Hypovolemic newborn pose a special consideration. Hypovolemia can be caused by fetal maternal hemorrhage and placenta abruption. In this situation, you should administer volume expanders in the form of normal saline, lingers lactate, or all negative blood products. Administer a 10 ml per kg bolus over 5 minutes. Case studies. We will now practice with some case studies. You are called to the delivery of a term gestation with no risk factors for sepsis. It is a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. How do you prepare for the delivery? Prepare a clean, warm, and well lit area. You will need gloves, clean, warm towels, and clothes, a ventilation bag and mask of the proper size, a suction device, scissors and tie for the umbilical cord, a clock or timer with a second hand, a newborn sized hat, and a stethoscope. Ensure that all equipment is clean, within reach, and functioning properly. This same equipment should be prepared before every delivery because it is not possible to predict when you need it. It is safer to be over-prepared than under-prepared. When the baby is born, she cries spontaneously and is pressed on her mother's chest. What do you do? Dry and stimulate the baby. Wrap her in a warm blanket with the chest exposed and observe her activity, color and breathing. She appears well and is breathing steadily with a good activity level. No further interventions are needed. Have the mother provide skin-to-skin -skin care to keep the baby warm and then encourage her to breastfeed the baby. Case 2. You are called to the delivery of a term gestation with no risk factors for sepsis. It is a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. The baby emerged with no respiratory effort. 
What do you do? Dry and stimulate the baby. Wrap him in a warm blanket with the chest exposed and observe his activity, color and breathing. You know that he's still not breathing spontaneously. What do you do? Check his airway to see if it is clear. It is not. It, appear, it appears to be obstructed with some amniotic fluid. What do you do? Position the head neutrally and suction his mouth and nose. He is now breathing normally. What do you do now? Keep him wrapped in the warm blanket. Check his breathing and heart rate. He is breathing comfortably at a rate of 50 and his heart rate is 140. He is overall well appearing with a good activity level. What do you do? No further interventions are needed. Have the mother provide skin to skin care to keep him warm and then encourage her to breastfeed him. Case study number three. You are called to the term delivery of mother whose membrane ruptured two days ago and she has a fever. After a spontaneous vaginal delivery, the baby emerged blue and limp with no respiratory drive. What do you do? Dry and stimulate her. There is no response. Baby is still limp, blue, with no respiratory drive. What do you do next? Check to see if her airway is clear. If obstructed, make sure her head is in neutral position and then suction her mouth and the nose. There is no response. She remains limp and blue with no respiratory drive. What do you do? Start bag and mask ventilation. Ensure that her neck is in a slightly extended position with a good seal of the mask over her mouth and nose. Give adequate breath size to make her chest wall rise gently. Ventilation should be started within one minute of the birth. You continue ventilation for one minute. What should you do now? Check the heart rate and assess breathing and color. Her heart rate is 150. She is now breathing spontaneously with good color and activity. What should you do? No further interventions are needed. Observe her for a few minutes to ensure that her breathing remains normal. Have the mother provide skin to skin care to keep the baby warm and then encourage her to breastfeed the baby. Because of the perinatal risk factors for sepsis, she should be admitted to the neonatal ward for ongoing observation and to be assessed for sepsis. Case study number four. You are called to the term delivery of a mother whose membranes ruptured two days ago and she has a fever. After a spontaneous vaginal delivery, the baby emerges blue and limp with no respiratory drive. What do you do? Dry and stimulate the baby. There is no response and he is still limp and blue with no respiratory drive. What do you do next? Check to see if his airway is clear. If obstructed, make sure his head is in a natural position and then suction his mouth and nose. There is no response. The baby remains limp and blue with no respiratory drive. What do you do? Start bag and mask ventilation, assuring that the neck is in slightly extended position with a good seal of the mask over the mouth and nose. Give adequate breath size to make the chest wall rise gently. Ventilate at a rate of 30 to 50 breaths per minute. Ventilation should be started within one minute of birth. You continue ventilation for one minute. What should you do now? Check his heart rate and assess breathing and color. One easy way to determine the heart rate is to count beats for 6 seconds and then multiply by 10. You hear 4 beats in 6 seconds. So the heart rate is 40. There is still no spontaneous respiratory drive and the baby remains limp and blue. What should you do? Continue effective bag mask ventilation and start chest compression with a ratio of 3 chest compressions for every one breath. Giving about 90 chest compressions and 30 breaths in one minute. Make sure that the breaths are effective with the baby's neck slightly extended, a good seal, and adequate size breath to see his chest wall move. If his chest wall does not move, the breath are ineffective. 
troubleshoot until you get at the point AI entry to see the chest wall move. What do you do next? After one minute, reassess. There is no improvement. His heart rate remains at 40 with no spontaneous breathing. He is blue and limp. What do you do? Add oxygen to the bag mask ventilation and continue the effective bag mask ventilation and chest compressions. After 45 seconds, he began to cry and move. What do you do? Stop the chest compressions and ventilation. Access to heart rate and breathing. His heart rate is now 130 and he's breathing with mild retractions and nasal flaring at the rate of 60. What do you do? Continue to monitor the baby for a few minutes while wrapped in a warm cloth with his chest exposed. The baby remains with adequate heart rate and breathing rate and the retraction and flaring resolve over the next five minutes. Now what do you do? No further resuscitation interventions are needed. Because of the degree of the resuscitation and the risk factors for infection, this baby should be admitted to the neonatal ward for cross observation and for sepsis evaluation and treatment. Summary Now having finished this chapter, you should now be able to prepare for delivery, identify prenatal conditions that increase the risk of needing resuscitation at delivery, Identify the equipment and personnel needed at each delivery in preparation for neonatal resuscitation. Explain the four increasing levels of neonatal resuscitation and how to assess the need to move to a higher level of intervention. And demonstrate effective bag mass ventilation in the newborn. The following are some key points on resuscitation. Neonatal resuscitation is one of the most effective medical interventions. Every delivery should be attended by at least one person whose only responsibility is the baby and who is capable of initiating resuscitation. Bag mass ventilation is the most important and effective form of neonatal resuscitation. Chest compression and adrenaline should be administered to newborns with extremely low heart rate if bag mass ventilation is not effective after one minute. Special consideration should be observed for premature infants. Thank you so much for your attention. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.